Warning, the video you're about to watch contains mathematics at the level of pre-calculus. All material has an assumed prerequisite of college algebra and trigonometry. While some prerequisite topics are reviewed briefly, a more thorough review of these entrance topics can be found by searching the web. It's the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook. Hello, my name is Roy Simpson, professor of mathematics at Cosumnes River College in Sacramento, California. This video is a continuation of a series on logarithmic functions, kind of a review for pre-calculus. Uh, we just uh, finished a brief review of the theorems, uh, properties of logarithms, and then we also talked about expanding and combining logarithms, because that is essentially one of the most critical skills you can learn from this for calculus. Now we're going to focus on logarithmic functions in general. Just the what are the kind of common characteristics about them? Um, it does this topic doesn't really fit very well with the rest, so I just diced it out as its own video. So I'm going to read this out really quickly. Logarithmic functions play a critical role in calculus, having an intimate understanding of their domains, their ranges, and their graphs is required for success in calculus. From the definition of the logarithmic function, the following statements are true. And I say are true there because there are several in a row. I just haven't, I only have one on this page. But first statement is that logarithms are just inverses of exponential functions of the same base and vice versa. And I put there that is if f of x is equal to b to the x, then f inverse of x is log base b of x. That is actually just from the strict definition of a logarithm, which we covered in a previous video, but I'm just gonna state it here. If the log base b of y is equal to x, then b to the x is equal to y. By the way, if b to the x is equal to y, then log base b of y is equal to x. So that is, logarithms undo exponentials and exponentials undo logarithms. Now you might say, I don't see that from this statement because log base B of B raised to the X power, the base of that logarithm and the base of the exponen exponential function there are the same. And we know from properties of logarithms that this will just be X. So the log undoes the exponential function. Now let's see if it works the other way around. So if I take the exponential function base B and raise it to the log base B of X. Well, if you don't know how to do this, you could say off to the right hand side, we're just gonna let Y equal log base B of X just temporarily, which tells us, by the way, that just means we have B to the Y, but this statement right here tells us by the circular argument that I talked about in the previous video, that B raised to the Y power will equal that X. So I'm gonna say this implies B to the Y power is equal to X. But wait a second, we have B to the Y here. So that must equal X. Thus, the exponential base B raised to the log, same base, just undo each other and return the argument X. So therefore, logarithms and exponential functions of the same base are inverses of each other. Second theorem that is kind of critical for us to remember is that the domain of the logarithmic function is all positive values of X. Uh, and the range is negative infinity to positive infinity. And that is simply from, again, the definition. Uh, so Y is equal to, let's just put this as log base B of X, tells us that B to the Y power is equal to X. Well, first of all, exponential functions never return negative numbers and they won't become zero either. So that means that whatever this turns back to us, whatever X is, it's got to be positive. That is why this statement right here is so important. You cannot have an argument for the logarithm that is negative nor zero. It's very important that you know the domain of a logarithm is positive, all positive numbers. The range, on the other hand, the y value, that 
can be anything. And the y reason why we know that is because remember, if y is the log base b of x, then b to the y is equal to x. Well, if you look at what we're used to working with, which is exponential functions here, if you look at the exponential function, and you asked, what could I plug in for y? You know the domain of an exponential function is all real numbers. So y is just an element of the real number system. That is y, same the same y, honestly. This y is an element of the real number system. That is the log base b of x there returns any number I want it to return between negative infinity and positive infinity. So the range is all real numbers. That's why that's true. So let's use that idea to find the domain of this logarithmic function, base two. It's a little hard to see, but that base is actually, that's a subscript two there. So this is log base two. Now we know that this argument, I'll go ahead and highlight it, has to be greater than zero. So let's go ahead and make that statement that x to the fourth minus 16 over x cubed minus 3x squared minus 24x minus 28, well, that has to be greater than zero. Luckily, we know how to graph this. Now, again, your instructor might teach you uh, a different way of finding out when this is positive, but me, I try to encourage my students to practice skills that are usually hard for students because they need to get better with them. And graphing is one of the weakest skills that most human beings have. We just have a hard time with graphing for some weird reason. We just are really bad at it. So let's go ahead and factor this and graph this and get a complete picture of what this looks like. So here we are, we're just gonna consider that we have this function, x to the fourth minus 16 over that polynomial. And all I did was quickly factor the numerator of that. Uh, we'll still have to factor the denominator, but for right now, it was a quick factorization, you should be okay with that for the numerator. The denominator, I'm gonna use the rational roots theorem. Uh, again, prerequisite here, not prerequisite for the course, but you have covered this material, if you're watching this video, you likely have already gone through the rational roots theorem. If you haven't, I highly recommend you watch my video on that. But let's go ahead and use the rational roots theorem. So our constant is 28. Our leading coefficient is one. Let's put constant and leading coefficient here. And let's look at the factors of each of those numbers, right? 28 is plus or minus one, plus or minus two goes into that, plus or minus four goes into that, plus or minus seven, and plus or minus 14, finally plus or minus 28. And I will not try all of those numbers, obviously. And you look at the ratios between the factors of the constant and the factors of the leading coefficient. Luckily, all those ratios are actually listed right here. And you just start with synthetic division seeing if any of those are zeros. So I'll start with synthetic division with just a one. Uh, and our coefficients for our polynomial were one x cubed minus three x squared minus 24 x and a minus 28. Quick check, bring down the one. One times one is one. Negative three plus one is negative two. One times a negative two is a negative two. Negative 24 plus negative two is negative 26. One times a negative 26 is a negative 26. And you can see this is not zero. So one is not a zero of that denominator. By the way, I think I mentioned in a previous video, but it's for one and negative one, it's actually a lot faster just to plug them in. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and just plug in negative one into this polynomial you'd get negative one uh, minus three plus 24 minus 28. And if you add all those up, uh, it's still non-zero. So that's definitely not equal to zero. Let me just double check that. Yeah, still not equal to zero, even if I check it. So I know negative one is also not a zero. Great, so then I'll go to two. And this is the nice thing about having like a computer or uh, yeah, a computer whiteboard, is that you can kind of erase your work as you go through. 
So trying two to see if two is a zero of that. Yes, you could just plug it in if you wanted to, but it's honestly a little bit faster to do it this way. So negative two uh, is negative 26, and that would be a uh, positive 52, which is non-zero. Okay, so obviously two is not a zero. Let's go ahead and try negative two. And again, just kind of cleaning this up very quickly. Negative two, bring down the one, multiply it by negative two, add, multiply it by negative two, add, oops, that's supposed to be a negative 14, multiply it by a negative two, and add, and you do get this beautiful zero. That tells me that negative two is a zero of that polynomial, and so x minus a negative two is a factor. So that polynomial will factor to x minus the negative two times one x squared minus, this is where I'm getting, one x squared minus five x minus 14. One x squared minus five x minus 14. And that is gonna factor to a negative seven, a positive two. So we've got this beautiful factorization done for us right now. So this is gonna be x minus two, x plus two. I'm just copying, and you can see I have the factorization there, and you can cancel factors. This x plus two will cancel with that x plus two. Now, normally at that time, I would go ahead and write out, oh, x can't be negative two, but I see that I still have a factor of x plus two downstairs, so there's no need for me to actually make that statement. And then if I'm gonna graph this, by the way, uh, if you were not going to graph this, if you thought, man, I dislike graphing, so I'm just not going to, you would still have to do everything that I just did. So you and I are tied at this moment for how long it's taken us to do this. But now with the graphing method, I'm just gonna quickly say, okay, well, because nobody's asked me to actually graph this, they're just asking me to kind of solve that, um, or not solve, but find the domain of that logarithm. So I'm gonna quickly chicken scratch out uh, this is the vertical asymptotes, which, which occurs at negative two, because that's what causes division by zero, and positive seven. Okay. And they're both multiplicity odd. I also have an x-intercept at two because of the numerator, so I'll just plot that somewhere around here. And let's see, a y-intercept at negative 16 over negative 28. Again, letting x be zero. I get negative 16 over negative 28, which is just a positive number. That's all I really care about. So I have a y-intercept at some positive value. All right, now I just need to see if I have a horizontal asymptote or if I have a slant asymptote. And you can see, because of the way the powers are, the degree of the numerator is higher than the degree of the denominator. So we are going to have to use long division to find out what the quotient is to find the slant asymptote. Um, it's actually not super necessary to do that though. Let's see if we can get away with not doing that because nobody's asking us to actually graph this. So starting at the y-intercept, I have two choices, go down or go up. There's no x-intercept, so I'll go up. Whoops, and I will accidentally run into the no-no land. Since that's odd multiplicity, it does this, there's no X intercept in this region. So it's going to not be, uh, not cross. It's not going to go up here. How do I know that it's going bending down like that? Because I know there's a slant asymptote, but that's actually unimportant in this problem. And then graphing to the right, I know it's going to go through that X intercept because the X intercept is multiplicity one. So then it's going to look like this. That's odd multiplicity on the um, vertical asymptote. So it's going to look something like this because there's not an x-intercept down here. So it's not going to cross. So this is what it looks like, okay? Roughly. If you drew yours to look like this, while the drawing is wrong, it'll turn out that your domain would still be correct, okay? So what does this mean? Well, I want that picture that's the graph, I want that picture to be above zero. In other words, above the x-axis. So I'm just gonna highlight the x values for which the function values are above the x-axis. 
Again, I'm going to highlight the x values for which their function values are above the x axis. And you can see I have solved this problem, which required us to find the domain of that logarithm. It is negative 2 to the x intercept, which is uh, positive 2. So negative 2 to positive 2. Domain, negative 2 to 2. I want to be strictly there. We're asking um, that this argument for the logarithm be strictly positive. So uh, it can't actually be, uh, you can't actually plug in x equals two because that would cause the argument to be zero. And to that, we'll glue on the next set of x values starting at seven and climbing to positive infinity. There you go. That's the domain of that logarithmic function. And I'm using as much as I can that you would learn in a pre-calculus course. So that should be somewhat satisfying that you've learned something and you're actually getting to use it. Maybe that's satisfying to you. Who knows? It's the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook overcomes. Obstacles getting in our way comes. Effects more than we can sometimes see. Things for what they are and work together until you feel at peace. Listen close, don't talk too much, that isn't cold. Sure, you may really hurt inside, it doesn't justify you to speak too loud and cry.